I've been on a bit of a US tour at the moment, uh, mostly on the East Coast, and I've just come back to the West Coast. I'm in California and Los Angeles. Uh, episode number one for the Rental Journal podcast was actually Paul Weaver from Mackinex. So I thought while back in California, I wanted to drop in and go to the US office for Mackinex. So very excited to be here uh, with John Stewart. So, so John, thank you for coming on the Rental Journal podcast. Yeah, great to be here, Mark. It's great, uh, great to and weird at the same time to have a conversation with somebody else from Australia on the other side of the world. Yeah, yeah. that is uh, when I walked in and I, I thought I, I knew that I was going to possibly do a podcast when I came here. Yeah. And then when you spoke, I was like, I've just traveled to America to do a podcast <laughs> with an Australian. <laughs> yeah, but it's good, though. Um, and in fact, I've been spending a lot of time here, so it's probably not so much of a co coincidence for me to be here. Um, but definitely a happy coincidence that we got to catch up. Yeah. Yeah. So, so maybe just for the listeners, like what's your current role uh, within Mackinex and so yeah. how do you get associated with the business? Yeah, I joined Mackinex as the CEO about, uh, in fact, more than one year ago, one year and two days ago, because uh, we had a celebration a couple of days ago. Um, uh, it was brought in by uh, Rory and Paul and Peter who... Um, had grown this business to a certain size and it needed professional leadership, not that it was unprofessional before, but certainly somebody to take it to um, the next level and scale the Mackinex business. So that's how I became associated with it. Before that, I was in unrelated industries uh, in some ways, but sort of construction products, construction materials. Mm -hmm. um, and so there were some uh, similarities, some synergies, but not directly in construction products mm -hmm. or even in the rental channel. Now, now, when I first walked in here and I was doing a tour around, the, the, one of the first things that caught my eye was that F1 car yeah. <laughs> on the wall. And then you, you stood up very proudly. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're interested to talk about it. So I purposely didn't ask you too many questions were out there. I wanted you to talk about it Good. while we're on the podcast. So uh, we might put a, like a, might take a screenshot and we'll put it in the link for the podcast as well. But do yeah. you want to just talk about what this F1 car is? Yeah, great. Um, Effectively, we needed a vehicle, pardon the pun, to be able to um, express a whole bunch of things at the same time. And uh, one thing that companies in general are not really good at is to be able to distill their message about what they're doing um, and how they're doing it into kind of a single graphic. Uh, so you, you, you may have sat through yourself, you know, 30 page PowerPoint presentations where we walk yeah. through the strategy. You know, for me, I just wanted to make it very easy for people to be able to engage with. So we have a car that has five wheels on it, four wheels and a steering wheel. And so each wheel represents an element of our strategy or, or a strategic goal. So the first one being um, renewables. So um, investing in our renewables range. We have, um, you know, a range of products, including a hybrid power system, a uh, portable um portable battery box, um, as well as container top solar and an increasing amount of products in that space. Um, but power generation's kind of been part of our recent history. We're just extending that into renewables. Another wheel is new products. We're known as an R&D, in, like inventive kind of company. We invent really cool products uh, that we think are game changers for the industry. Uh, so having more of those to be able to get into um, Certainly the rental industry, which is where our bread and butter is, where our DNA is. Um, so it's the second, second wheel. Uh, the third wheel is the Americas. So we have a now quite sizable business here in the US and we export also into Canada and Latin America. Uh, so making sure that we have the resources that allows that business to grow uh, with, our, with our partners is a big focus over the next three years. That's wheel number three. Uh, the driver's wheel, by the way, is marketing. So this is something that Mackinex, I think, can do a lot better in. Uh, we have the best, in some cases, untold story uh, ever. And so I think you know, engaging with marketing platforms to be able to tell that story is a really important thing. The last wheel, of course, is the manufacturing base. So um, for us, we manufacture in various parts of the world. Um, during COVID, we understood that supply chain for everybody was turned on its head. And for us to be able to grow where we need to be able to grow, we need to make sure that we have a really solid manufacturing base. So it's really shoring that up um, uh, because our volumes have grown significantly. So we need to make sure that we have the capability of doing that. So mm -hmm. that's important as well. So that's the car bit. 
It's all supported around by the uh, around the car by the we call ourselves the pit crew, uh, and so we work with really lean pre processes to make that car run as best as it possibly can. Uh, we have a set of agreed behaviours and values that help support that as well. But hopefully, um, and the feedback that I've gotten is that it's resonated as a as a as a pictorial view of what's happening in our strategy. Yeah, well, I think it's it's good as well because. It's visual and it allows you to continually see the direction where the company wants to go. Yep. You mentioned before about having a 30 slide PowerPoint deck. Yeah. And you're sort of like going through the, the PowerPoint <laughs> to find out, oh, what are we doing here? And what are we doing here? Visually being able to see that particular strategy and, and talk about it as well. The fact that it's an F1 car like yeah. it caught my attention. Yeah. So I think that that's a, it's a pretty uh, smart way to sort of convey your strategy. Yeah, well, it seems to have worked. And the other thing that it's done, oddly enough, maybe, is that it's given rise to a whole bunch of metaphors. And so, you know, people say, do you know what? I'm just driving the car faster, John. Or they'll say, you know, I feel good. We're part of the pit crew. We're going to make this thing run faster. And so you have a whole bunch of those metaphors. And, you know, I've heard individuals in the business describe their roles in terms of how they get that thing to run really well around the track. So it's been... It's been a good kind of uh, vehicle, again, pardon the pun, mm. for engaging people on our strategic journey and their role in it, which is really yeah. important as well. And then you spoke about the, the lean methodologies as well. So is that yeah. something that is really important to Max and Akinex around the manufacturing side? Yeah, so um, certainly from... So when, you, when you're scaling a company, you so before you scale a company, you can actually have manual workarounds for a whole lot of things. And... As you scale, you actually do need to have really good processes for doing things. They need to be repeatable and they need to be relatively waste-free or as waste-free as possible so that they can be repeatable. And the idea is all of that stuff should be valued by the customer. And so the customer gets consistency in every experience or in every interaction that they have with they have with Machinex. So um, for me, lean is something that I picked up on my journey um, uh, actually at Borrell and uh, it's worked really well to help engage people. So what you often find is, and it's one of my pet hates, where somebody comes in from management and says, this is the new process, and the people that are affected by the process are affected by that process. And so for me, Lean is a good way of, again, engaging our people who are affected by processes, mm -hmm. for them to manage that, to own it, and to own the improvement because they have to live with it, whatever the outcome is. Yeah. So uh, Lean's a big part of that and you, it'll, it'll, it'll enable us to, to scale and grow. But also, also we do uh, an annual employee survey and one of the things, that's, things that came through very strongly is people want more training and development. Um, and that's not unusual in most organisations, but um, we feel like we, we wanted some training, more training and development. And I think giving people lean tools and skills uh, was part of a very natural part of that journey too. Mm. And I feel like when you do optimize a process, it's a lot easier for you to measure that process process as well. Yeah. If things if there's multiple steps and spreadsheets and whiteboards and all this sort of stuff, yeah. you can't really measure. And if you can't measure something, it's very hard to improve in what you're doing, especially when it comes to customer experience. Yeah. I have a um a, a developing reputation as being a bit of a a whiteboard guy and so you know I'm big really big on visual management so making sure that people understand how well we're doing and they're able to see it um, and most people's response to that is yeah but you can just log in and you can go into this screen and then this screen and then this sub screen and this sub report to be able to see all that I just want to walk into a business like here here in the US and visually be able to see how we're running are we doing a good job are we doing a not so good job how's that in terms of our people, our customers, um, our suppliers, what are we doing? How are we doing it? How could we be better? And so measuring it's the first part of that. Mm. But the second part of that is to have that as a visual aid to figure out how we're running the business and how we could run it better for sure. And then you, so one of the one of the wheels is the Americas. Yeah. So so maybe just to give context to the listeners, like how global is Mackinac now? So we are, we sell into about forty countries. Um, around the world so which is pretty cool I think and when I when I when I listen to uh, Rory Kennard talk about this he talks about some things that he's personally invented and how cool it is to see them 
in these far-flung corners of the world, things that he's invented that we've produced on a large scale that end up in all these applications. Uh, so about 40 countries around the world. Um, we have an office here in, uh, in the US and we have an office in Australia that's in Sydney, uh, which is head office. Um, we are working on Europe at the moment, so we actually have a distributor in the UK um, and we have some plans to expand our footprint in Europe and to do, uh, to do more in Europe. Our products are probably products that lend themselves uh, well to things like productivity and safety. And I think those things are very much front of mind for Europeans more than probably uh, most parts of the world. So uh, we should absolutely be doing more in Europe and it's a part of our focus as well. So, so how do you grow in a market like that? Do, do you have to find locals? Like what's the, because it's a big step to go into a new country. So, yep. or even region like that. So what's the first step that you do there? Yeah, um, so distributors. Um, so uh, one, of the, one of the things about our products is they're demonstration products in a lot of senses. So we follow the, the model that we used in Australia when we first started out. And the really key thing for us is that rental channel. So it enables people to experience our products before they buy them. And it gives them choice as well. So if, you're, if, you, if you want to trial one of our products, you're very welcome to do that. You can walk into you know, a Kennards or a Coates branch in, in Australia or any other independent hired um, channel and, um, and be able to experience our products. And then if you use it enough, and if you happen to be, say, somebody who does floor prep all day every day and you're removing tiles, then you might want to have a jackhammer trolley um, for yourself. And so you're able to then go and buy that through our other distributors as well, uh, or even directly. It's the same model we, when we started in the US, to be honest. Um, similar, similar model, we have really good relationships with um, the large rental companies and also the independent rental companies in the US and through Canada. And that was kind of the genesis for us. This is where it started. And then people get access to your products and they have these, and you, you go to trade shows, right? And you, you have these moments where people see things like the powered hand truck and have this moment of, wow, that's really cool. Yeah. And it's that kind of game, game changing nature of our products that, that I think is really great. And then, it, uh, and then people experiencing experience them more, experience them more, and they may want to buy one directly for themselves. And it's no different to our situation in Europe. So it's, it's through um, those rental channels that uh, we have a lot of success and people um, get access to our products. They understand them, they see them and say, that's, that's a great product. Mm. Um, so that's kind of how we've scaled up to this point and it seems to be successful. So we just keep doing the same thing. Yeah. Uh, doesn't seem like a good reason to change that now. No, definitely yeah. not. It, it's finding on episode one with, with Paul, he actually spoke about attending the ARA show and then getting introduced to Home Depot uh, through the ARA show. And it's those, it's those sort of little opportunities that can grow like a, and change a company altogether. Yeah. Uh, like having uh, Home Depot as a partner is obviously an amazing yeah. opportunity in the US. And I'm assuming it's trying to find those right partners in, in Europe as well. Yeah, it's we're quite careful about how we do that. Um, we're very careful about which partners we choose to work with because they're a representation of our business on some level. And so, um, you know, we, we have very strong values in terms of the way that we do business. And so we want our partners to share those values. So we're very careful about which partners we choose. But also from a strategic point of view, you'd be mad not to um, choose the right sort of channels that give you the right sort of access to the right sort of markets. Um, so we're very care careful about the planning for all that, none of that's a mm. uh, mistake, or um, you know, we don't leave any of that to chance. Yeah. yeah. And so, so coming in as as the, the global CEO, so is there any? I guess you mentioned uh, the leadership aspect to it. So, so the leadership style that you're sort of bringing in it would be great for you to cover. Like, I guess what's your go to plays? Yeah. Uh, in, in that area. Uh, go to plays. That'd be <laughs> giving away too much, I think. Uh, um, so for me. You know, I talked a bit about the products. So products are really important to our company, but equally our people uh, are really important. So making sure it's going to sound all Jim Collinsy, but having the right people in the right seats on the bus is really important. Um, you know, in my 12 months, we've been able to bring some people into the business who've got some really wonderful capabilities to be able to help take us to that next level. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, I suppose my style is uh, inclusive but decisive. 
So it's funny, you know, we have, um, uh, we, we don't do things by committee, um, but for the important, the important decisions that need to get made in our business, we make sure that we consult pretty widely. Um, and I've got this habit of talking to people who actually know what they're talking about before we make decisions that affect them. So that to me, that inclusiveness is really important. Um, but again, at the end of the day, one of the things that's made Machinex really great is our ability to pivot and to be agile and nimble. I think I was saying to you earlier that, um, you know, the thing that doesn't suit me and large businesses is that you, you have to do everything by a committee or steering committee. Yeah. You need to go and put in three levels of approval before you get ready to get ready to do something. And uh, here in Machinex, I've kind of found almost a perfect home for my operating style, which is we make a decision as a group, um, we own the decision, we leave the room and we get on with it. And it's as simple as that. And if somebody says, oh, you know, I'm not sure about this, we say, okay, let's get back in the room. Um, uh, well, I thought we agreed, but that's fine. We'll get back in the room and we'll agree it again. And then after that, we'll just get on and do it. So it's probably in terms of my leadership style, it's definitely inclusive, but um, decisive. You know, I was uh, had a catch up with uh, the other owners of the business um, a couple of days ago, and we were talking about um, the things that we were able to do over the last 12 months. It's always quite um, cathartic to think back about what you've done over the past 12 months and we've done an enormous amount of things and when you stop and think about them and you even list them out on a whiteboard of course um, you, you say wow we're able to do so much and I don't know any other company I can't think of another company I've worked at where you can be so um, agile or mm. nimble and decisive uh, it's a really wonderful thing in our culture mm. well, uh, well it yeah. really represents the name of the company as well yeah yeah like if making inefficiencies extinct. Like if you weren't nimble and it didn't look at trying to make those inefficiencies extinct, it, would, it wouldn't reflect. So it's great to hear that culture matches with the purpose of the company as well. It's funny, you know, there's, I worked at, I can't tell you who it is, but I worked at a company before where they were responsible for excellence in a particular field. And when you shine that light back on them, they're awful at it internally. And so the great thing about Machinex is that we're not hypocritical about this. So we have products that help in terms of um, productivity and safety, reliability, but ultimately profitability of our customers. And they remove, um, remove inefficiencies, they remove waste. And then we shine that light on ourselves from time to time. I wouldn't say we're 100% great at it, but we, we shine that light on ourselves and we say, do you know what, we could do better. And it's actually a common thing to hear around the halls in the offices at Machinex is, do you know what, I think we could do better. I think we could do better. Yeah. And so I heard a rumor that Machinex is actually leaving California. Yes. We're not allowed to tell anybody just yet. <laughs> so it um, depends on when this podcast comes out. <laughs> but uh, we'll tell the market probably a month before we go, which is um, we look like we're finishing the construction of a building in Mansfield in Texas, which is part of the greater Dallas-Fort Worth area. It sounds like everybody's moving to Texas at the moment. It's the in thing to do. Maybe they're all following us. Um uh, yeah, so we're, we're really happy about that because it allows us to expand. And so when I talk about that, one of those wheels on the car being the Americas, one of the things that we'll be able to do is actually expand. We'll be, we'll be able to do some local production or assembly um, and we'll be able to operate service on a level that we probably haven't been able to in the past in the US. Um, service is a big part of the business in Australia and it's part of you know, getting closer to customers. So what's the best way of getting close to a customer? Um, you know, helping them resolve some issues. And you work together and that's a great thing about our, uh, the way that we operate the Australian business. It's something that's missing to some extent over here. And it's something that we recognise that we could be better at. So when you, that shining that light internally or back, reflecting that back on ourselves, it's something we could do a lot better. Mm -hmm. And it gives us some flexibility um, to be able to do some different things as a business. So yeah, that's the reason for the move. Um, it makes a lot of sense for us um, and we're all actually quite excited about it. Uh, for us, it was a no-brainer. And when you think, and I've, every time I go there, I take photos and send them out to the whole company and maybe people think I'm a, I'm a little bit over the top by doing that, but I'm, I'm, it's just an expression of how excited I am to move. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, like, it's like watching something grow, yeah? You, yeah. you want to be excited. 
Yeah, I want to do the time lapse thing though. So I've got this particular spot I need to take a photo at at a certain height, okay. and uh, and so I've been doing that um, every every time that I've gone there, so we can do a time lapse. Awesome. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. I'm trying to do that with building my house at the moment, but nothing's happening. So it's no, like, it's the very, time lapse would look like the same thing. <laughs> it's, it's a like very a still. long time lapse. <laughs> Pick the wrong time to be building a house. Oh, uh, well, I bought the land four years ago, and then we delayed and delayed and delayed, and then we wanted to start building it. It's just forever. So we've just accepted that it's going to take a long time. We're not in a rush. Yeah, yeah. And probably if you left it for a couple of years, you'd probably find that material prices would go down and you'd probably have better access to trades in that time as yeah. well, hopefully. Yeah. I mean, um, I think we're all crossing our fingers that global supply chains get back to normal, whatever that is, uh, sooner rather than later because mm. it causes huge disruption. Oh, definitely. Yeah. So look, it'd be interesting to learn a little bit more about you as well. So... Uh, one of the questions I like asking a lot of people is what you think maybe has been the biggest challenge you face in your career so far. So off, off the cuff, like anything sort of come to mind? Uh, yeah, I was running a, uh, a timber company um, a few years ago um, that had kind of like all of the things could, that could be wrong with a business were wrong with this business. And so literally making sure that we had the money to pay bills, um, uh, literally making sure that customers customers were still buying from us um, and making sure that we had suppliers who would supply us and uh, you know I used to lose a lot of sleep over that um, turning that around was a huge challenge and uh, and something that you know I was really proud of doing in a relatively short period of time uh, because it took a lot of moving parts to be able to get it to work uh, and Probably chief of those was the people, making sure we had the right people doing the right things in that business. There was a lot of talent and making sure we released that talent to be able to do the right things. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, be, be in the field with customers rather than be uh, filling in spreadsheets or updating inventory and doing all of those sorts of non-value adding type things. Um, but lots of opportunity for process improvement as well. Um, and lots of opportunity, so we improved out of sight the processes of that business so that we eliminated a whole bunch of rework and waste and mistakes that were going on with a very manual system um, and it, and in the end just getting supply of a product that was in short supply was a real challenge as well that we we're able to overcome and expand the product range as well so for me uh, that was my first CEO gig when I was um, early 40s and I it was a baptism of fire absolutely and so but I really loved it I really enjoyed it and it taught me a lot of things about um, you know the right levers to pull in a business um, the importance of people the importance of process um, and genuinely believing in what you're doing um, and having that passion it's one of our values at Mackinex so that was a huge a huge moment mm -hmm. So, so when you are going through that baptism of fire, as you said, and yeah. in the mix of it, obviously there's a lot of stress that comes along with that along the way. Yeah. How do you typically deal with that sort of stress? Um, I think for me, I've got a good support network. And, uh, you know, even if it's... And it's a diverse support network. So I have people in my life who I kind of bounce things off. Um, having an understanding wife's probably helpful too. Um, we have... Uh, we have a walk most nights and one of the things that we well, we have a rule we're not allowed to talk about the children uh, otherwise it just turns into why are the children doing better and so uh, it gives us an, both an opportunity to vent about what's going on and um, even sort of throw some ideas around and um, so that that's helpful um, but also have some mentors in my life that um, you know I bounce things off and ask them questions, what would you do? And they never give me a straight answer, which is frustrating, but they always help me find the right, yeah. the right answer. Uh, so those, those things, and probably for me, um, you know, a bit of mindfulness as well without, without kind of coming up, off as a total hippie. Uh, you know, I make sure I am on message, make sure that I understand what I'm saying and make sure I understand my content and take the time to kind of think about that. So what happens generally is that you know I have a full meeting calendar of meetings and I'll go bounce from one to the next. Mm. And um, it's not a very healthy thing to do and it's not a very productive thing to do in a lot of cases. Um, and I think we're all guilty of doing that 
in COVID, especially during COVID lockdowns in Australia. But um, for me, actually taking the time to think about why am I here at this meeting? What's a good meeting outcome look like? All of that reduces the amount of stress. And I think understanding what you're doing and why is helpful as well. Do you ever block out your calendar? Yeah, I do, yeah. Uh, it literally has block in it. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I learned that from a, another mentor of mine. Um, and he would just say, you know, I just need an hour to think about this. I need an hour to, I'm going to have lunch today. I'm going to have a proper lunch and just think about what I'm doing. And so I will have time, literally might be half an hour, where I just say block. I don't want, I either need a buffer between a heavy meeting X and heavy meeting Y. Um, or I might use it um, to, to ring my children. Or I might use it to kind of get out of being in the moment of doing what I'm doing in my role to then start thinking about the other things that are actually important in life, like family. Yeah. For me, I, I, I block out my calendar all the time as well. Yeah. It's just a habit that I've got now. But I, I have a whiteboard that I always write things down on. And I use that whiteboard as almost a way to like think about things that I'm trying to do strategically. And it's almost like I'm talking to myself in a way, uh, might be half an hour, might be an hour, might be 15 minutes, but I find like the more I strategically think about some things and just think about like a goal or a topic or a challenge or whatever it is. Yeah. It's amazing. Like how many ideas pop into your head yeah. and you write down those ideas and then you action the idea or you, that idea leads you to another path. Yeah. Those sort of, I think a lot of people don't do that sort of stuff and they, they're constantly just in this sort of grind circle and have, you can't yeah. really move forward too fast if you're, yeah. you're just stuck in that loop. It's funny, you know, I, somebody talked to me about the reason one of the causes of stress is actually you're at this state here right now and you've got to be at a future state and stress is caused by the uncertainty in between those two things. And for me, if you just stop and think about what are the logical steps that I need to undertake, and if I write them like you, it sounds like you're a whiteboard nerd as well, <laughs> writing them down on a whiteboard or somewhere visual for me helps. So what do I have to do next? What are these milestones that I've got to get through uh, to get to the next step is really, really helpful. And the other thing that I found about whiteboards is it allows interaction. And so um, somebody can say, somebody can look at that whatever's on that whiteboard and say oh, clearly you're trying to solve this problem and they can, they can say give comment commentary to yeah that sounds like it'll work I've tried that one before it doesn't work have you thought about this mm -hmm. and you can get the kind of um, benefit of diverse thinking through doing that as mm -hmm. well yeah and it keeps you accountable I do, oh, it, I, I do it for lists all the time yeah and I, I, I write them off rub them off and stuff like that and I, if I keep if I look up there and I see that one's been there for like two weeks or a month yep. and it's like, all right, clearly I'm avoiding yep. this. And then if I'm avoiding it, typically it adds more like mind, like cl clogging my mind a little bit more. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's interesting. Like those little things, like you, you labeled it mindfulness. Yeah. I think they play a big part in reducing stress and making yourself become more effective in whatever you're doing. Yeah, I, I think so as well. And... Yeah, and and do I have the answers to all of this, or do either of us have the answers to all this? Probably not. But, yeah, because um, everyone's got their own flavour for it as well. It's not like yeah. like like your mentor, you said. Like when you go there and you, you're seeking answers, and they they sort of just give you like a little bit of like more questions. Yeah, more questions. <laughs> yeah, more psychiatrists. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I jump, I jump on the couch, and you know that's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah but that, that's sort of like you want. If someone told you what to do constantly, you're not really a CEO anymore, are you? Yeah, well, you're not learning, I think, yeah. is the other thing. And, you know, the the older you get, the more you realise you don't know. And I think um, it's a bit of a cliche, I know, but I really believe that to be true. And so I think you've got to, you've got to give yourself over to those learning um, opportunities. Mm. And, um, and the one thing that I've found that I do is I make sure that I don't treat people's questions as criticism. Because it can quite easily feel like that, um, where somebody says, well, have you thought about this? And so you can say, that person is saying to me that I haven't thought about it. Or you can say, yeah, have I thought about that? And, and I think once you let go of the ego of some of the, some of the, the decisions that you have made or are making, um, you, know, you know, 
that can be quite powerful as well to kind of really be in the moment of actually learning something about what you're doing. And the other thing is, you know, you've got to let go of the the weight of of people think you have all of the answers all of the time, especially in my role. And the answer is I don't. And um, I think it's unrealistic for anybody to. Mm. You know, I probably have a hypothesis. I probably have a group of people that I would ask. But no, I don't have all the answers all the time. And in fact, it, it goes against what I was talking about before with lean being really powerful because the people who know all the answers are the people who are interacting with whatever yeah. the subject that you're talking about is. Yeah, and I like that. Yeah, not judging someone based on their question. I feel like I've... I've uh... I've made that mistake a few times. See, it's powerful, right? Yeah, yeah, you're the, doing it now. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the ego kicks in because you, you're already, like you're you're making an assumption without sitting in that person's shoes. Yeah. And yeah, I think that's why sometimes, like uh, I can't remember who, what leader spoke about this, but it was about sometimes like the most silent person in, in the boardroom can be the most effective because they're the ones that are taking in all the information and taking both perspectives both perspectives, both sides of what's going on and then making an educated decision. Yeah. Yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, um, yeah, I, I would say that um, it's been the most important thing for me is just to let, to let go of having to be right all the time mm. and to listen to those people in the room and often they get overlooked. Yeah, or know when you're wrong. Yeah. That's yep. probably even a bigger one, yeah. Sometimes, and admitting it. Yeah, sometimes people hold on to things and they yeah, they 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 just can't accept that fact. And it yeah. can build grudges. Very disturbing grudges. Yeah. No, I I I agree with you. I think um I've seen it. Um I think ego causes a whole bunch of problems in the world and I think some of that's your own ego or somebody else's ego. It, it can be the cause of you know, wars and mm. down to um, divorces, down to, you know, whatever you want to talk about, problems at work. It's about kind of people not w being willing to let go of having to be right all the time. Mm. So, yeah. So if you were to give some advice to your younger self, yeah, early 20s, mid 20s, what would you say? I was dreading this question because I don't have a very good answer to it. Um, and the reason is, I probably wouldn't do anything different in my life. I don't, I don't have one of those kind of regret sure. mindsets. Um, I think kind of all of that is helpful in molding you to the person that you are. Um, I probably, probably the ego thing would be, would be, would be it for me. So letting go of having to be right, letting go of having of the feeling like you have to have all of the answers all of the time. And I think if I had have learnt, learnt that earlier, um, would have been helpful. And the other one for me is the power of getting things done through others, the power of um, what, watching people thrive. So one of, one of the things that drives me is the feeling of watching people thrive in the right environments. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if I had have, um, if I had have understood the endorphin that was um, endorphin release that was associated with that earlier on in my career, I think, I think that would have been very powerful too. Mm. So is that something where you were almost taking like more control over a situation and then maybe now you're sort of letting people take more ownership and yeah. letting them make their own mistakes along the way and stuff like that? Yeah, so um, definitely, you know, I was a bit of a paint by numbers kind of guy, you know, there's a process, 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 and people aren't processes, uh, people are people. And, and sometimes the two don't mix very well, it's like oil and water. And so, you know, that's one side of it, and the other side of it is what you what you can see when you watch somebody really be released to do, you know, their best work, and and the way to get that out of them, the way to support them, rather than to tell them what to do. Mm. Um, I think that was really powerful and really obvious, of you know, to be honest, uh, but really powerful uh, thing that I learned somewhere along the line in my career. Yeah, well, I think there's a form of creativity in there as well, like. Let's take this podcast, for example. Let's say Mackinac said to me, you have to ask these seven questions. And if yeah. you don't ask these seven questions, we're not doing the podcast. Like, I wouldn't <laughs> feel like a very, very fun podcast. That's true, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Just in case anyone's we, listening. We actually that's haven't true. even asked a single one. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, like, for me, like, I would probably hate the podcast. 
Yeah. Uh, for me, it's it's all about a creative, uh, like having conversations and building things up. So yeah, I think you can apply that to to, to molding people and, and lending people to their own devices as well. Yeah. I mean, again, I'm referencing something that we talked about before we started recording this part, this stuff. But you know, when you when you're talking from lists and you're talking with you know, uh, preconceived agenda, it can seem contrived and um, unnatural, artificial, and doesn't have the same impact as when people are kind of engaged in mm. something. And when you're genuinely asking something and genuinely listening to something and you're in that moment um, and connecting, that's for me the creativity as well. And yeah. it's not just in this conversation, it's mm. in a lot of those conversations I have with the people I work best with. And uh, it will be, we have a conversation about something and it'll be a good back and forth. I'll learn something, they'll learn something, and then we'll both be better for it and we'll go off and do our work better yeah. in some way. I've always found that. Yeah. And so then, in the scheme of all that, so then how do you define success? Uh, success for me, success for Machinex? Both. Um, uh, I don't know whether there's an end state for success, I think would be my best answer. I think, you know, for me, it's a journey of iterations so uh, or experiences. And so you see where somebody's been able to do their best work. So, you know, I'll, without telling you who it is, um, I've watched somebody in our company really grow. And so we said to him, we, want, we think you've got it in you to get to the next level. We are all going to kind of not give you our best if we're sort of giving you part-time um, mentoring. Let's get you full-time mentoring and get you up to the next level. And I've watched this person go to the next level and they ask better questions. Um, they interact better. They have better relationships at work and are much more effective. And I just watch that and I get a, I get, um, you know, I get a kick out of it. Yeah. And for me, that's success. So success is not an overall success. We've, we've achieved the three-year target. I mean, that's a form of it. But for me, it's a series of kind of almost unrelated events mm. that kind of lead to success. Because, you know, you have to be, you have to have fun along the way, obviously. But you have to celebrate the small things too. Like when, you, when, you, when you've got, and also pat people on the back when they've achieved those things as well. Make sure that it's recognised. goes a long way too. So that's kind of, for me... Where I see somebody grow, um, for me, that's how I. That would be an ultimate measure of success mm -hmm. for me. Yeah. Um, because all the rest takes care of itself. Yeah. The reality is that when this guy's asking better questions, when this guy's having better relationships and interacting on a whole new level at work, our organisation runs better, and I know we make more money out of, out of our company as a result. Mm -hmm. I know we do. It's not even I think we do. I know we do. Yeah. And, uh, and if I had that times, you know, 100 people, then that's amazing success. But I'll take, I'll take that one yeah. and I'll start working on the next one. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, because you didn't name the person, you can use this content with all your employees now. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. say, oh, it was you. It was you. Yeah. <laughs> you know who it's not. <laughs> yeah. No, no. It's, it's definitely... Uh, but I've seen it in, in most people that I've worked with, almost everybody, maybe everybody. That uh, at Machinex, one of the things that I've really enjoyed without pushing the Machinex uh, barrow too hard, and everybody that's joined uh, says the same thing, is that we have the most welcoming culture and curious as well. And so people want to know what your questions are. So um, they openly invite you to test them and to understand them better. It's deeply ingrained in our culture that we question things we're curious about things and we try to solve those puzzles in the world and it's led to great innovations yeah. but it's definitely part of who we are so i think you know the interactions that i've had with people since i've started everybody's been really open to getting better getting mm. uh, doing things differently um trying things out i mean that race car strategy that we were talking about is a first for me you know this is i'm, I'm inventing stuff as well so we, we we have a truly innovative mindset and dna and so i said to the board we're going to trial this because we're used to writing a business plan and uh you know the business plan gets written we put it in the drawer and forget about it and so i said oh, i think we could i think we could do better than that and every single person on the board said do you know what 
I'm behind you, have a go at it. And it was a bit clunky at times, but we got there. And still Rory wants his business plan, but that's okay. Um, we we, we try, trialed something and the next time we do it, it'll be so much better. Yeah, awesome, awesome. All right, John, well, thank you for coming on the Rental Journal podcast. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me.